Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 200 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Welcome to the season-ending roundtable episode. The eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed the title of the episode, which is the Female EV Driver Roundtable. I wanted to do an episode which discussed the whole area of female drivers in the EV world, marketing to them, selling to them, women charging in unsafe situations, etc. Lots of potential areas to discuss. So let me introduce the panel today. I'd like to start by welcoming Imogen Bogle, who is a presenter at the Fully Charged Show. You will have seen her on episodes chatting with the Pull to Pull team in Iceland, standing on some floating solar panels in Portugal, schooling Jack Scarlett on aerodynamics in a wind tunnel, and checking out electric planes in Vancouver. Welcome, Imogen. Thanks, Gary. And what a privilege to be on um, episode 200. Yes, I, I can barely believe it myself. Now, I'm probably not the right person to lead this sort of discussion, given that I'm not a woman. So, Imogen, would you be willing to take over here, introduce the other guests, moderate the session? And when you've all put the world to rights, let me know and I'll pop back in at the end and wrap up the podcast. I think we can manage that. Um, thank you for entrusting your delightful podcast to uh, somebody else for the day. In that case, what a delightful introduction. Um, but I am joined by some far more, infinitely far more fascinating women who I'm absolutely thrilled to be sharing this round table with. So here on the podcast, we have... Sarah Sloman, Chief Strategy Officer for Paythrough, an EV charging software and payments company. She is also part of the EV Cafe, which is an amazing forum to share information and expertise surrounding the EV transition. Claire Miller, all-round expert mobility advisor and consultant, who also sits on about 10 zillion boards. George Thurman, who is the founder of Women Drive Electric, which is a collaborative space where women, car consumers, and women in the EV industry combined to make the, e the switch to EV that much easier. Uh, she's also business development manager at EV Body Shops. And Linda Grave, who is the founder and CEO of EV Driver, which provides consultancy services for EV charging networks. And prior to that, she built the EV Driver network of public EV charging points in the east of England. So quite a line up there. Um, where to even begin? Well, we are having this conversation towards the end of the year, which is often a time to kind of look back and reflect on the year that we've had. So I wonder whether we could kick things off by describing some of the really big shifts that we've seen and experienced um, in each of our, our various spheres, which is a big question, which I definitely should have teed you up beforehand. So we'll see where we go and we'll see where we land. George, I wonder if I could start with you because it's been quite a phenomenal year for you. Yes, um, it's so funny that you, you're the one that points out my other job because um, I can't, my life and my heart and my soul is in women drive electric and um, occasionally I forget about my other one, much to my, yeah, uh, don't tell Adam, my husband. Um, so yeah, for, for us, it's been phenomenal. We, we just started off as a, as a little Facebook page and um, I started introducing myself to people in the industry so that we could get some expert help on the website and um, it's just kind of barrel rolled from there really and I've ended up with a, a nice little career in the EV industry meeting the, just the best bunch of people ever that I've met in my life in an industry and yes things we're going great guns we're working on a website at the moment which will bring the kind of thing that we do the community spirit as well that we have in Women Drive Electric we're going to take it out of Facebook it will still live there that's it's still where the forum will be but we're going to offer it out on a website now as well. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. And, and that community aspect is something I want to return to in this conversation because it's certainly something when I've bumped into you at various kind of events, it's like, oh, so lovely to see familiar faces and to see you. And that sense of community has been certainly very, uh, it's been really a, apparent that it's sort of cultivating around, you know, this shared ambition for Switch to Electric. So um, it's great to see that. And I wonder, Claire, you've had an interesting year because you have this sensational helicopter view where I feel like you're just like, you know, you're almost like, I, I almost imagine like you've got this sort of mastermind table sort of moving the various chess pieces across the EV transition. Thank you, Imogen. 
I, I wish I could see most of my table. Uh, maybe that's the, maybe that's the best analogy for the um, industry at the moment, actually, which is, yeah, there are so many moving parts, so many interesting technologies, interesting businesses. And I think we're very lucky in the UK that we have lots of market kind of conditions that mean that is arguably the best place to be innovating in EVs, charging and energy. And that means that it's a really fertile ground for startups and scale up. So I think the thing that I'm excited about this year, and as you say, I, I, I've sort of changed the way I work from being full-time Octopus EV Director of Tech and Innovation and have, have sort of gone into that sort of advisory consulting um, way of working so I could scale myself across lots of businesses and technologies selfishly because it's really fun and, and I still get to do a bit with Octopus as well. So, you know, that lucky me. But in terms of the, the way that the, the world in the UK is moving, we're starting to see, you know, startups become scale-ups. So we're starting to see, you know, one, two, three, four people become 20 or 40 or 100 bigger even. And I think that's really exciting because it means that something's working in terms of bringing new technologies to market and new solutions to customers. And I think the challenge that I can see ahead is actually um, well, a couple of, of big ones, and I don't know if we've got time to lift the lead on these, but the political environment is not necessarily the most helpful at the minute in terms of confidence in the market, confidence in the product, confidence in the fact that EVs are incredible and do the job. And that also has a knock-on effect to investors and confidence in terms of investing in new businesses. And so I guess it's a brilliant place to be, and I can see technology and innovation in business models and and services coming in all directions. My concern, I guess, is how to keep that going and how to keep the next generations of startups coming through. But, um, but yeah, it's been an amazing year. It's been really incredible. And I'm very excited for, for all the solutions that we can see now sort of coming to fruition. We've had a number of conversations recently on, on the Fully Charged show where we're starting to return to these companies that we've previously featured on previous episodes. And seeing just the scale of growth is absolutely phenomenal. And every time you see someone sort of grow or bring out a second version of the product, you're like, yes, this is exactly what we need. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. It has felt that this year has become way more polarized, way more politicized. And that keeping that sort of positive energy definitely feels like something that we're all going to need a little bit of uh, in 2024. But Linda, I want to come to you because you're also in an, an advisor and consultancy sort of role. And I wonder what are the kind of the big themes that you've come across this year and that you've observed in, in your world? Well, I think it's uh, sort of carrying on from, uh, from what Claire's just said, really. I, I've made a little note here that I wanted to mention about councils and PERDA. And PERDA is the thing that, that people don't know. When, when councils go into the election phase, they have to stop what they're doing with any competitive bids and, and basically halt what they're doing completely and start up again when everything's sorted out. So this caused a few halts in my work program uh, last year with local elections and things. And we will have another election soon. Is it going to be spring or is it going to be later? I guess it, there's, you know, none of us quite know yet. But my fear is that some of these projects that haven't quite crossed the line will slow down yet again. Um, and although we've done great guns, I mean, going to the positives of, of last year on on installation of charge units and, you know, how we're doing. I, I was at an event recently, quite a few of us were there actually, the Greenfleet uh, uh, events and earlier on in the day there was juice and somebody mentioned there, and I can't quite remember who it was, but it took 10 years to install the first 10,000 charge unit and it took seven months to install the last 10,000. So, you know, we are doing incredible things here in the UK and I think, you know, big pats on the back, we are we are totally getting the infrastructure done. There's an awful lot slowing us down. It's not just the councils and PERDA. It's, it's planning, it's permits, it's road access, it's, you know, you name it. It's nimbyism. There's all sorts going on. But if we can get past that, we, we are going to have very good infrastructure. And I'm sure Sarah will touch on, you know, uh, payments and processes and how that should be improving um, dramatically as well so that we have a, a smooth running and efficient EV charging infrastructure as well as plentiful. So that's my hope um, and reflection of what's gone on this year and the hope that the elections don't cause too much chaos next time around. 
Yeah, we've um, I've just got an episode around the top technology 2024, and it's sort of like this is all really exciting. And yes, we've got a million elections, and that is quite terrifying to see how this is all going to sort of uh, play out. But I mean, what a statistic that the first 10,000 took 10 years, you think? And then the last 10,000 took seven months. That is absolutely extraordinary. Um, and Sarah, I guess you're kind of, you're really sort of seeing that change that, you know, it used to be a case that you needed about a good billion different apps um, in order to make that charging experience even just a little bit manageable. But that is shifting. And I think that's so interesting in a world where actually, you know, we are at a point where anecdote really matters and that seamless experience really, really matters to lower that perceived barrier of edge point to the world of EVs. But yeah, what are your reflections from, from this year? Oh, well, thank you. What, what a year. What a year it's been. We've seen brand new legislation come in, which is intended to make the user experience easier. And yet been a bit of a strong, a bit of a, a chokehold, I should say, not a stranglehold for uh, a lot of the operators that now have got to go back to the drawing board and rethink the rollout of their infrastructure to now comply if they want to make those charges and a revenue stream for themselves. And to help drivers have access to more easy charging. So it's been really tough working with suppliers. I really feel for people at the moment who are having to face that challenge. But you're right. It's about putting the driver first and thinking about what they need, what they want, and not sort of deploying a sledgehammer to crack a nut when actually simplistic technology that's been around for years and years. Uh, the first charger we put in in the Bristol, West of England area was 2010. That charger probably still stands perfectly well today, even though it's only a 3.4 kilowatt rather than a 7 or 22 or 50 that people seem to want these, these days. But I agree with Linda, that rollout this year has been incredible. Hubs seem to be popping up left, right and centre from sort of big players like Interval, Osprey, GridServe. And that has in turn had a hugely positive impact in the face of adversity, uh, political adversity, to people who are on the fence and were doubtful but now feel a little more confident that perhaps they could go electric. We've seen consumer trend move from those uh, we would call the low-hanging fruit, who have the affluence, have the appetite, have the facilities like off-street charging or a home charger, but made it really simple and easy to think about going electric. So we're in that slightly tougher phase, 24, 25, 2024, 2025, about the next wave of drivers who will be looking to shift or considering shifting. And it's our collective responsibility to make that as easy as possible, showing through demonstration how physically possible it is and how not so scary it can be. So now I think 2024 will be peppered with positive uh, news stories that we all need to amplify across our channels as best we can, provided, of course, they are justified, measured and accurate, I would say. That's a very, very valuable caveat to add to that. So it seems like, you know, it's been an extraordinary year for everyone on, on this, in this discussion. But also it's on the backdrop of, you know, a changing legislative background, a lot of kind of fear, uncertainty and doubt that may exist in the market and that actually 2024 needs to be about, yeah, those positive stories, proving that this is perhaps a better experience and an easier experience. So I want to come to, you know, the role of women in the EV landscape. But before we do, I want to know what EVs do each of you drive? And we'll start with George. That's not a good question for me, Imogen, because I don't actually own a car. If you did have an EV, which one would you go for? If I had the choice, it would probably be between two, which is one is the first car I ever drove, which is a Tesla Model X, which I love with two small boys and all their mates and the gold wing doors when it's raining, the, the size of it, the speed of it. I couldn't fill it up when I took it camping once, which really annoyed me actually that I couldn't actually fill it up because then I couldn't moan about it, the size. So it would either be a Tesla Model X or uh, the the Genesis GV60, which I just adore. I love the styling of it. I love the boost button on it. I love so many elements of it. It's even got a voice memo in it. So if you're thinking about something and us women, we do, whether we're mums or not, our brains are wired the same. We just think about so many things at the same time. And it's got this voice memo um, button in it and you can just chat away to yourself and then play it back later. And I just love that. Oh my goodness. I did not know that that function exists and that I need that in my life. Because especially when you're driving, that is a good time for, you know, a bit of a think about your thoughts. I need that 
Yeah, I've left quite a few messages about women drive electric. So some some poor person who next drives one of the fleet GV60s, the uh, press GV60, sorry, uh, will have yeah lots of lots of messages telling them about women drive electric on there, which is no bad thing. Absolutely, Linda, what EV do you drive? I currently drive a Tesla Model Y. So I've had it since it'll be two years this March, which I love. I had a Model Three before that and was desperately waiting for something with a practical boot. You know, saloons to me, they don't make any sense. You need a hatchback boot, don't you? you know, we've got loads of stuff we need to throw in the back. So I love the Model Y. I'm not sure I've got voice notes, though. I'm now jealous. I'm going to find out about that. I also um, currently have a Tesla Model Y. And I love it for two reasons. A, obviously, it's great for the dog because you have that hatchback boot. Really, it just is so easy to drive. Um, but also... When I carry my nieces anywhere, it has the uh, whoopee cushion, which <laughs> they find equal measures hysterical and disturbing. Yes, well, I have grandson, so now we have to put on all the different things in there. So, um, you know, whether it's Spotify nursery rhymes or whoopee cushions or whatever, it, I, you know, obviously when it was built, he clearly had very young children. Yeah, we have uh, spent a lot of time changing the colour of it on the screen to, you know, bright pink. All of that stuff. It's like, I mean, it, it's good because it gets them in the car quickly, which can often be a bit of a headache um, otherwise. Um, Sarah, how about you? Well, I'm in the Model Y club too. I wasn't. I wasn't at all. I, was, I had a, a few before that, but they were all centered around functionality, practicality. Kia E Nero 4 Plus was a great one. Um, MG Zeta EV was also really good, but I like to go outdoorsing. Outdoorsing. So uh, anything to do with hiking or running or cycling or camping. And the Y features a very flat back seat, very long vehicle, and you can set an ambient temperature so you don't freeze to death or wake up with full condensation around you for anyone that's ever slept in, in a car. So it, it's the practical functionality versus the performance. Getting 300 miles to reach charge is it's critical for me to don't have a home charger, so it's very expensive for me to recharge my car. And I wanted one with maximum efficiency opportunities. Not as good as the e-Nero, though. Definitely better miles per kilowatt hour on the, the uh, e-Nero. Do you know, I've, I've currently got a Honda ENY1 um, on loan this week and it has been absolutely phenomenal that the efficiency just is nowhere near close to what it is for the Model Y. Um, and given that the base spec Model Y and the Honda ENY1 are a similar price point, you're like, oh, especially if you're using a public network, the Tesla Model Y just wins every time, I'm sad to say. Okay, so I think it's safe to say that everyone here is, is pretty evangelical about going electric. But we know that we're not there yet in terms of uh, it's still not necessarily the number one choice for new, um, for new car ownership. And we know that there's nowhere near parity when it comes to diversity in the industry or in electric vehicle sales. So, and I think this is where we're going to spend the bulk of this conversation. But why is that? And what do we think needs to change? Well, I think we need to make it clear that we're we're not, you know, everybody says that the automotive industry is 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 very man centric, and it, and it is. It, it's just the way that it's always been, and we're not, you know, we're not man bashing. It's just that we want to be at the table. We we want to be a part of the conversation. I want to be targeted for marketing. I want to be asked what I do and I don't like about a car. Cards should be should make your life easier, not more complicated. And I think that that's what's changing a lot at the minute with, with the change into EVs. There's so many more opportunities to change the way that cars are made and, and the, the offering that they give you that it's just a perfect time to change things up. And I think including women in the industry, in design and marketing, et cetera, is just the perfect place to start really. Yeah, and I think that's where it really does, you know, one of the root causes of this is how are women represented within the industry and how does that manifest in the design of these vehicles? Um, and anecdotally, one of the things I think, well, if you were designing, if you asked all women to design a bike seat for a man, you might not get an optimal design necessarily. Um, and one of the things that I have to say about the Onyx 5 that I think is absolutely wonderful, and I don't think this would have been why it was designed that way, but because you don't have the sort of central, um, like console bit, you've got this like really easy entry point to just put your handbag on the seat without sort of navigating various obstacles that sit between the driver's seat and the passenger seat. And it's those sorts of things that I think that's more serendipity than it is intentional. Um, so I think you're, you're absolutely right there. 
Claire, I'll come to you with our next question. We've opened up the discussion in around uh, the fact that we're all evangelical about the transition to EV. We know that we're not there yet in terms of, you know, new registrations are not 100%, uh, but they are improving. But we're also nowhere near parity when it comes to female representation, both in terms of sales and within the EV industry. And the question is, why is that? And how could we start to bridge that gap? Um, and we've just heard from George and I'm, I'm going to ask the same question to you. I think when we think about you know, folks who buy cars and then the way that like sales messaging and sort of media has traditionally been targeted, there's a lot more kind of variation within the genders than there is this binary of male and female. So I think actually making it more accessible, lots of information, you know, easy to digest, you know, maybe not necessarily the geeky end that I uh, personally enjoy a lot and making it way more like democratic for everyone to learn actually opens it up to uh, lots of folk who haven't been sold to before. And that very much includes women, but it isn't just women. And so I think actually thinking about this from a, through a different lens uh, and making it way easier to uh, you know, educate folk and, and learn about how these vehicles work, how charging works, that benefits everybody. And therefore, uh, this is not about you know, us versus them or uh, say a real sort of binary. This is about democratising access to information that everybody needs. And so um, that's what gets me excited to think about it from that perspective. You know, it's not just the... Uh, I don't know, may maybe it's overly stereotyped, but doesn't necessarily feel like it from where I've been coming from for my life, which is, you know, vehicles are for certain people, interest in cars is for certain people, and media is sort of serving up messaging in a certain way. That Yes, that works for a certain group, but not for everybody, and therefore there's lots of space to go at. And that gets me excited about what lots of you are doing, actually, you know, on, on this on this podcast today. It's so interesting because I say it's not, you know, the sort of naive perspective would be show more women in advertising material, which is definitely an improvement. But actually, it's all about that messaging, all about proving that this is a way to reduce fat, become more accessible, all of the other additional ancillary benefits that you also see. But that is missing from the sales material, perhaps, and the sales messaging. Linda, how do you think that should change? What's missing from that messaging sort of specifically? Well, yeah, I think um, Claire's got it spot on there. You, I mean, who reads that small print at the bottom of a car ad? I mean, who even understands what it's talking about most of the time? You know, you've got grams of CO2, you've got WLP, you've got, you've got so many acronyms at the bottom there. And we, you know, focus on the speed that a vehicle can go from 0 to 60. Is that relevant to most of us? You know, I just... I've never really got that. I'm probably more interested in how quickly it goes from 60 to naught, you know, um, focusing on the safety elements of the vehicle. And, yeah, try to communicate that properly while also thinking that only 26%, was it, or, or, of, of people ever buy a new vehicle. So first of all, you've got your new vehicle sales, then you've got your used vehicle sales, and there is that who trusts a used vehicle salesperson, uh, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a hat that has been thrown in, isn't it? Um, we've got to simplify the message. We've got to stop making it too techy. And that's not dumbing it down. That's just, you know, making it accessible. Uh, and talking about things that we, I mean, uh, focusing on females, I think we're really practical. You know, you want to know what you can fit in the boot. We've all talked about our hatchbacks. We're always thinking about, you know, can I fit the dog in it, the buggy, that this, that, and the other? And my mother was an antique dealer, and we we were only allowed to get a car if we could fit a chest of drawers in the back. You know, so it's always been that sort of practical element. Um, but you know, we we need to get the message across correctly. But one of the other things I feel about the, the car design for women is the seatbelt, and I actually have an issue with the seatbelt in the Tesla Model Y. I've got the seat up as high as I can go, and I'm five foot four. So it's not that small, uh, but it does go across my neck. You know, I, I don't know how uh, injured I would be in an accident. I don't actually want to find out, but, you know, there's, uh, there's other things in design that need to be thought of for women or smaller people. Um, but sorry, I could bang on, I'll stop. No, I think there's two really interesting things there. There's sort of the technical aspect, which 
we don't, no one really cares unless you're a proper kind of car geek about those stats. It's tell us the outcome. What does that actually mean? How is that going to improve my life or make something easier or better or what have you? But there is also the design aspect. And I think this is something that I have also experienced on the Model Y. As much as it, it works perfectly and, you know, the charging network is super reliable. So many aspects of it are just absolutely brilliant. I do feel continually as if I'm borrowing someone else's car and that the dimensions of it were built for somebody else. And conversely, in the Honda EMY1, it is, and I'm five foot three, um, it is the first car where I sat in the, right, my uh, preferred position in the seat. I can use the left elbow rest because my seat isn't so far forward that I no longer have access to it. And I can see the entire display on the screen through the wheel because the wheel isn't blocking my view and it's the first interior of a car where I've been like this works for somebody of of my height and it doesn't feel like I'm borrowing someone else's car and I was really astonished at how obvious that felt to me and how going back to the Model Y I was like this just feels too big (laughs) not designed for me yeah um but Sarah, I wonder, you know, on that kind of technical aspect, um, what you do is inherently a very kind of technical sphere, but it's all about translating that technology into something that feels not techy and not difficult. Are there sort of specific requirements that you see from um, a male audience versus a female audience? Do you sort of kind of see how do you, are you accommodating those two different audiences perhaps? We've talked about some definitions back in the, the Green Fleet Awards where we were trying to get to the bottom of what accessibility really means. And is that accessibility for the vehicle to be able to use the charger? Or is it accessibility for the human to be able to use the charger? Or is it actually about accessibility of technology and how to make the charger work in the first place? And I mean, we, we, we're lucky to have a few Tesla uh, people on this call. And that's something that we've all noticed is you just plug in and it sorts itself out. Uh, with me, it's the least. So all of the charging that I I do sub 20,000 miles goes through the cost of my lease. So I don't even have to pay for the time that I use the supercharger. But of course, there are so many other charge points out there that we are all reliant on. And even if we have home chargers and do high miles, you're going to encounter what I call out in the wild, uh, charges out in the wild. And you'll have to very quickly decipher multiple payment options. And I think that's what annoys me particularly. And something that Kate Tyrrell, who we're hugely fond of, she uh, runs Charge Safe, talks about a lot is Adding in another layer of complexity like hard to access payments and, and technology just makes people feel flustered, uh, intimidated. And uh, there's an element of vulnerability that I'm proposing that if I have to use my iPhone, which is also my car key, and I can't just quickly do a sim- sort of simple Apple Pay checkout process, then I start to feel quite uh, insecure holding my phone there whilst I download yet another app, as you say, and, and log on. So this new legislation doesn't discriminate male, female or anything. It's, it's all about just making things smoother and uh, as simple as possible by offering multiple methods of payment. And that's something I'm very focused on for 2024 is trying to get to the bottom of use case versus application. So if you've got some charges that aren't really very publicly accessible and, and don't have to comply with the regs, it might be worth costing up if you can install a contactless reader anyway, because the number of users who come to your site may well pay for itself over, over the period of time. But I'm not seeing a difference between male and female or, or, or other users. It's really just about making it as simplistic as possible for any human. <laughs> and that can even be to the font size. That can even be to um, what, the, what smartphones it can be loaded onto so as not to discriminate against people who have only got new phones. You know, if the app doesn't work on an older phone, for example. So, you know, we've really got this. We've got this tied up. We're really thinking carefully about how to apply years and years, decades of payment experience to what's essentially a very innovative and emerging landscape and sort of taking everyone with us. And I just always say, I just want to pay. Just let me pay. There must be a simple way to pay. I just need to charge my car. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> that's what you want to do. Do you know, that, that's absolutely, I think that's nail on the head and picks up on some of the points that Claire's made, that it's about, it's not as binary as I posed the question. It's about making it accessible for everyone. And actually that comes from, if you can absolutely nail the most difficult use case and make that as seamless as possible, that makes everyone's lives infinitely easier. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, the campaign around lowering curbs that was um, led in the, in the US by people in wheelchairs, but actually 
If curbs are lowered for people in wheelchairs, that makes life easier for people wheeling suitcases or people with other forms of reduced mobility or prams and, 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 and. So yeah, it's that, what is that most sort of critical use case and how do you make that sort of a priority? And then everyone can be brought on that journey. Um, but George, you've been to some amazing events this year and including, I think I'm right in saying the She's Electric events. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I think I would manage to get myself into every single event that was on this year. Um, I even managed to get um, a press pass for me and my two little boys to go to Carfest. Oh, wow. That was a real eye opener. And, and that was fantastic. That was absolutely fantastic. But yes, um, been to between myself and my business partner, Michelle Breffitt, um, we've been to four of the She's Electric events across the country this year. And what are the kind of conversations there? What are the really kind of common questions that you pick up on? Definitely with, within the panel sessions, when it was opened up to um, questions and answers, it was definitely a lot of talk about batteries, battery life, how they're made, um, where the cadmium and the lithium come from that are in them, um, and the, the general longevity of having an electric vehicle. So the sustainability question was one of the biggest ones that we got. After that, it was definitely charging anxiety. That is so fascinating. I would absolutely have not have guessed that it would be the kind of supply chain visibility of batteries, battery lifetime, where the materials come from. And I guess that kind of I, speaks to the fact that if you're thinking about transitioning to an EV, it's also potentially because you have that, you know, you're environmentally mindful. You're thinking about, is it actually better for the planet? Which, of course, we know that they are. Um, how fascinating. and. How, what has kind of been the sort of takeaways? Have people come away thinking, right, I feel like that is the right decision for me or has it sort of sparked more scepticism? What, what's kind of been your sense of the atmosphere in the room? I think, I think the panel's dealt with the, the questions quite well. Um, and a lot was explained about like the new lithium mine down in Cornwall, et cetera. So, but also comparing it to the life of, of an of, um, ICE vehicle. So you can still buy a secondhand car and it will still have a fantastic battery life on it. And, and that's the whole point, especially with all of the, the fleet vehicles that came from the first wave of fleets going into electric. They're all starting to come on the market now. So you can get yourself a very reasonably priced used EV that's still got an amazing battery life on it that will still last you a good 10 to 20 years if you continue to drive it. So explaining that kind of thing definitely moved, switched the mood of, of the room when when there was what what we felt to be negative questions when people were worried about batteries, charge anxiety and payment anxiety, I think, which is what's happening now, is um, is something that needs to be worked on. But as Linda said at the beginning, we've just made great, great strides across this last year. Sure. And I think that is something that for 2024, the secondhand EV market, it feels like we're going to start really, really seeing the impact that that will have, certainly in terms of EV adoption. But that charging anxiety question, I mean, Linda, do you think it's it's fair that that still exists? Or do you think it's a kind of once you experience driving an EV, an EV that anxiety goes away? Or, or is it a valid concern? Oh, I think, I think it's 100% fair. I think when, when you're driving a Tesla, we know if we're using the, the, you know, the Tesla takes you to the Tesla charge stations anyway. That's where it wants you to go. Uh, we have the easiest life. We plug in. We don't need to do anything. Um, and it, that's the kind of mark, benchmark that everyone needs to get to for, for the rest of the vehicles and the rest of the charging. But of course, it's it's not so easy because Tesla built their cars, they built their chargers, they know where every single car is and what it's doing at any time, state of charge of the battery, simple. Different charger manufacturers, different vehicles um, are trying to get that information in one place. It's not going to be as easy. So I think plug and charge is is a, probably a little way off. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure Claire and Sarah both have more technical detail on that. But the, we definitely have a problem out there with some of the charging infrastructure, and we can't pretend we don't. Um, it's it's complicated. Um, Sarah and I were just talking about this. The, the RFID card symbol is exactly the same as the contactless payment symbol, but in two different places on the charge point. There's signage high up on the, you know, you have to read so many different areas of the charging. You're not sure which, um, you know, which socket you need to use. Um, various different things that you've got to get your head around for each different 
charging operator. So you will very quickly find your preferred ones that, from a reliability point of view. Um, and I know George just had a, a bad situation the other day, um, which really highlights how bad it can be when you're desperately just trying to get home. When you have a good experience, of course, you don't really talk about it. You just get on, do it and head on home. But we, we do need to do more. And there's lots of us trying very hard to improve what we've got and make it a little more streamlined across the whole of the networks. It is getting there. It's still early days. You know, we, we've got lots of legacy stuff still out there, but um, the networks as ranked by ZapMap, which I think this ranking is a good thing. People want to be at the top of that. Um, and they are, they're doing really, really well. They're doing a great job. So we've got many, many good networks out there doing great work, some that need to step up a bit and other new ones entering the ground. I mean, this is, there's, I think, three new networks that have um, entered this year that I know of, which have got big money behind them. So there's a, there's a lot happening that should improve. We just want them to make it simple. And that kind of, the ZapMap ranking, ChargeSafe UK, um, that we've already mentioned, just phenomenal to hold people to account and to reach that standard that makes it so much better. But if we were, you know, we've spoken a little bit about designing in usability and accessibility from the outset and designing for kind of all stakeholders and users. So if we were to design the most perfect charging experience, what would it look like? And Claire, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, Linda has sort of alluded to it, but I think uh, personally plug and charge. So you know, for all the things that Tesla doesn't get right uh, in some of their experiences, what they have done exceptionally well is create an experience around charging, which is you know, unmatched by anyone else, uh, which is giving you information about the charger before you get there, preparing the battery to be um, fast charged. Uh, when you get to the charger, seamless experience, you only have to plug in. Everything else is dealt with, you know, the financial transaction and, the, and, and, and all of that kind of data on the back end. Now, that only exists for Tesla right now in that very sort of end-to-end -end experience. But lots of the CPOs are getting there and trying things. And the next generation of charging experience is called plug and charge. And plug and charge means that there is something on the vehicle and there is uh, the ability to read that on the charger. And as a customer, if you associate a payment method, then the car can speak to the charger when you get there and the car and charger can swap details and you get that Tesla-like charging experience, but you get it everywhere. And so part of the new regulations that a few folks have mentioned on this podcast already um, is kind of underpinning that by requiring all charging networks to enable roaming. Uh, but that's only part of it. We need the vehicle manufacturers to be enabling their vehicles and we need the charge point manufacturers and the, and the sort of software providers to enable it as well. So I think it's going to take a good sort of three, four, five years to see that become completely mainstream, uh, but it is coming and I think it's coming fast. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see that. And then how other services get built on top of that. Um, because that will be underpinning lots of other interesting, valuable, um, and, and also kind of just time-saving and, you know, practical um, improvements in the way that we use our vehicles. Just to, to, to Linda's point earlier, which is, you know, women are often, if nothing else, very practical. We've got a lot going on and we've got a lot of things to hold down. And so, you know, the last thing you need to Sarah's point is to be juggling a phone, you know, the wind is howling in, it's lashing rain and you're trying to plug in and download an app and there's no signal. So, so yes, I think it, plug and charge will start to alleviate a lot of those issues. Um, but obviously putting, putting roofs, putting roofs on charge points would be really awesome too, from a very practical perspective. <laughs> oh my God. Massive shout out to Fastnet at this point. It does make such a difference. And it is something that I'm like, yes, I would like that shelter. I don't want to, you know, I'm going somewhere. I'm actually bothered to wash and dry my hair. Don't want to get wet. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have just had a look at the time and I cannot believe that we've been, we've been chatting for sort of almost 45 minutes. So I want to kick off, I want to round off this discussion um, by asking you one last question. And I think it's really interesting that everyone here on this call is either in a, it works in an advisory capacity or is involved in some kind of community building, whether that's the EV cafe or women drive electric or she's or attending the she's electric events. So I guess the question is what value does that community bring and what motivates you to kind of continually share that EV message? 
And George, I'll, I'll start with you again. I think for me, um, especially because women drive electric, we feel like we're in the middle. So we're working really hard with consumers to help them and engage them in the whole process of, of getting an EV from choosing one to salary sacrifice, insurance, roadside assistance and public charging. And the way that we can make that better for them is by having women on the other side because of the way that we think, the, what the discussion, if you listen to how we're all talking about it, we want to make it practical and we are, women tend to be more practical. And so to get more women into the industry, we need to talk about it more and we need, to, so I'm even working on my consumers to try and say, this is a fantastic industry. It's fun. It's new. It's fast. It's the future. Why don't you come and join us? And then we can get more balance in the industry which will change up how we're sold to, which will change the design. I'm beaming, sorry, I sound ridiculous, don't I? Um, but it will work. It's a completely circular thing, the way that I see it. And hopefully that should, should make it better for everyone and, and, and make it a lot less daunting to, to, to purchase a vehicle or even start the search for one. Do you, you say you don't have a ridiculous talk, but you can hear the smile in your voice. It's so wonderful. And that's the other thing. When I see you at your events, you always have this enormous smile on your, on your face. And I feel like it really helps make this whole industry feel as exciting as we know, as we know it is. But Sarah, how about you? Uh, the EV Cafe is amazing. Um, but what do you think the value of that kind of community building it's invaluable, in fact. It's something that we're really focused on because we know that numbers swell belief. And with that, it's not about sort of bringing everyone with the same view. We really challenge uh, disruptive thinking. And our sessions, we specifically tell people, we do not come on the show to sell. We will talk over you. We will cut you off. Because what we want to do is really get to the root of issues and find ways to collaborate to sort of drive that forward. And we've reached a really interesting point in our growth where we, we, we want next year to go what we're calling on tour in 24, to find those pockets of community who haven't yet had that chance to explore EV away from the kind of sales room floor where things feel quite staged. This is about real examples, real case studies, real improvement plans, and really underpinning that with commerciality. It's, it's sort of the B2B platform at this point, um, but we're hoping to grow that like the Free Charge show does so well. Uh, to really break down those church walls and uh, speak to more and more people. And uh, it makes me beam uh, as well. But in terms of trends, trends in the community, I'm, I'm forecasting something about this payment anxiety piece. And we know we started with range anxiety, but the vehicles have improved. We know we had charger anxiety, but technology is helping us to not only locate better chargers, but see them working better when we get their fingers crossed. But this new one, payment anxiety, we cannot fall down those first two pitfalls that we did. Payment anxiety cannot happen. We have to work harder to make sure that the sort of general swell, the general public, who we don't yet have in our EV world or community, don't have to experience that. Let's make things as simple and streamlined as possible. And that's only going to work if people are honest about what's going wrong and stop trying to oversell solutions. When really, like I said earlier, it doesn't have to be a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It can be a really simple, easy, safe and secure, fully compliant, does what it says on a tin type job. And that, that, that's my passion. That's what I really want to see in 24 and 25. And it all starts with us, people in this group, the rest of us. So, I mean, on tour in 2024, A has a fabulous ring to it that is extremely exciting. Um, I think it's so, so important that like actually, you know, we are transitioning out of the early adopters and into the mainstream where a single bad experience could be the difference between someone committing to this technology and being very anti it. And that payment sort of anxiety, absolutely, we cannot afford for it to exist. Um, now, Linda, you again, in your sort of advisory capacity, I think, you know, we've spoken a lot about how perhaps women are slightly more practically minded. And in your kind of consultancy and advisory period, you're able to sort of do a lot of that sort of problem solving. Is that your experience? Is that what brings you sort of motivation to operate in this space? Absolutely. I, you know, I'm completely passionate about what we do. We do need to bring everybody along with us. And I think for me, apart from my consultancy work, I run an event, a very small scale event, which I've done for about six or seven years um, in the local community. So I'll run it at the Suffolk Showground and it's an EV experience day. And the idea is to get as many people like the fully charged in the vehicles, you know, once you get somebody in a car on a private test track and they can actually drive it around, you know, all the objections start to fall away. So 
I keep, I see lots of vehicles at events that are static and, and I just think, well, you know, it doesn't really mean anything to me like that. You've got to get in it and drive it. And once you do, then, you know, it will really help. So I'm quite passionate about getting people behind the wheel and talking to the dealers, to the charge point operators, to the utility companies, to everybody. Um, and Claire was one of my fan speakers last time and hopefully Claire, I'll be in touch shortly. Um, you know, we, we can talk about all the different aspects of owning an, uh, an electric vehicle and, and why it is easy. It's not complicated. And of course, by the time we run this event, we will have those used vehicles we've just been talking about. They will be affordable vehicles for everyone to drive. So I'm really passionate about that side. And then with, with my consultancy hat on, it's dealing with the uh, charge point operators, new charge point operators, councils and everybody, and helping them build infrastructure that is really fit for purpose with the right charge unit in the right place. And I think, you know, once we get those few things right and uh, Sarah solves the payment issue for us, um, happy days. But I think some of the themes we've touched on are, are so fascinating. We've spoken about the design and the need for designing for accessibility, not just for women, but actually for those really critical use cases that make everyone's lives just that much easier. Um, but I think the other things that we've spoken about is around that community building and actually people need to experience these technologies to appreciate that they're not intimidating. And actually something that I definitely find in my sphere, you tell someone your job and they're like, oh, Laura, is it, is it going to be EVs? Do we really think that that's the way forward? And you say, oh, have you actually, um, have you ever driven one? And as soon as they say no, you're like, well, Try one first and then and then we'll have this conversation again. So Claire, I think just as a, as a final comment from yourself, I think you are one of those people that just has this phenomenal ability to connect the dots and to connect people together. And it feels like that's something that just brings you such joy in that you kind of piece this puzzle together. Um, is that, am I correct in saying that? You are. Yes, you are absolutely correct. I'm now, the, I'm now the one that's beaming. I feel very seen. Thank you. <laughs> I'm well, job done for a Monday, I think, if I can bring a smile to your face. Um, but in terms of that kind of that, the role that you play in terms of bringing those dots together and kind of pushing the industry forward, how critical is that? And do, we th do you think that there are enough people who are making those connections between these different spheres? Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, I, I, I think it, the, the thing that worries me is that it's still very early days and so, yes, it's important that a lot of these service providers that we are all relying on and going to rely on more and more need to have a, like a solid foundation. And yes, they need to start getting to profitability, right? Or, or at least some past profitability. Um, thinking about, you know, public um, charging operators as a good example of that. But it's very early days. And so I think, you know, connections and introducing folk and, you know, just, just people who are working on kind of complementary technologies or even people who are working on, you know, stuff that will be competing in the future. Right now, you know, it, it's, we need all of it because we need to go fast and we need to electrify everything and we need to decarbonize as fast as we can. So to me, it feels like a really important if we can connect people. Um, along the way and it builds community and I think that reflecting back on what you said about you know all, all of us are in some way are creating communities and contributing to, to those communities um, for me that's about connecting as many people as I can um, because mostly that's you know going to just strengthen what's going on in the industry and also to help bring people in as well and I think that's another thing that all of us on this podcast do a lot necessary without thinking that we do it which is opening the door for others you know being an example and a role model to others and um, and showing that there is no kind of one type of person one type of woman to be in this industry there's space for all we need everybody so please come on get on board make make, the, make all the connections you can yourselves but also bring folks with you I think that is a perfect and beautiful note to end on. And honestly, I think we could carry on for at least another four hours. So maybe we should do have this conversation again, but maybe next time in person and, and with wine. It'd be quite nice. In fact, just seen in the chat, Sarah totally agrees with me, wine required. And with that, I am going to hand back to Gary. Thank you. What a fantastic discussion. Uh, lots of things covered there. I particularly liked, and again, this was one of the reasons that I figured that I wasn't the right person to, ho to, to host this was the comment that you made there about getting a woman to design a bike seat for a guy. I mean, I would never, ever have come up with that sort of a, 
um, an analogy. Uh, I also liked Linda and her mother's chest of drawers and, you know, how you would fit that into the back of a, a vehicle. Absolutely fantastic. Um, it's time for a cool EV or renewal thing. Share with your listeners. Who wants to go first? Um, I will. It's George here. Go for it. So there's a young lady called Lexi Limitless. She's, I believe she's 21 and she is taking an electric Ford Explorer and she's circumnavigating the globe in it to show how you can actually move a vehicle around the world that's electric. And she's having an absolute whale of a time. Obviously, everything isn't going smoothly. Not everything does even in this country, but it's a really exciting journey to follow. And she's on Instagram and TikTok and all the rest. And it's just such a great, not only is it the car and the electric charging, but it's a woman doing it. So obviously I'm a big fan. Fantastic. Uh, I've got a link to that. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Anybody else want to add a cool EV or renewable thing? Me, me, pick me. I mean, I'm yes, not saying go, it's cool to everyone, go. but it's very exciting to me. So we talked earlier about the uh, ability to have a contactless terminal on every single AC charger, but I've got a bit of a problem with this, not just from a sustainability standpoint, but a cost and revenue standpoint too. I'm backing a company called Bright Green, who have invented some massive touchscreen kiosk that has enabled RFID and contactless within it. And the key is you need one of those to power the sort of row of chargers. So looking forward to seeing one in the wild. In the meantime, uh, I'm just trying to explore its capability and really just check that it's exactly what we need. Fantastic. Anybody else? Um, mine's not new technology. I wanted to bang on about something that I installed in 2015 uh, in my renewable energy business back then, which was floating solar. And I think, um, I don't know, I'm sure there's a very funny pun here somewhere about it coming to the surface or whatever, but I think floating solar is ready to really take off because it's super efficient. And uh, the, the one that I did check before I came on this program, actually, uh, that it is still floating and it is. Um, so installed eight years ago and outperforming any of the rooftop solar that we did for them. So it's on a reservoir. It coincides, its production coincides exactly uh, with the irrigation pumps. So its usage at that time of the year is really, really high along with the production. So it's a marriage of usage and production at the same time, which I think is brilliant. Excellent. Claire, do you have anything? Yeah, I uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, stuff that Tesla talks about that then sort of becomes more widely known about. So we talked a bit about um, plug and charge and that as an experience you know, is going to become more widespread. Well, there's, there's two others that Tesla are looking at um, and I, they tie with a couple of the companies that I work with. Um, one is around wireless charging. So wireless charging for fleets. So I'm going to shout out um, Electric Green, a UK uh, a wireless charging company. Um, and Tesla recently talking about how they're going to bring wireless and sort of alluding to how they're going to do that. And they acquired a company um, who uh, who do sort of wireless tech. And the other one is around a, a range extender. So the Cybertruck, completely ridiculous vehicle, but uh, some people are going wild for it and, you know, you've got to push the boundaries. Something that, a feature that launched with the Cybertruck, and by the way, if you haven't seen the Cybertruck, just Google it and just kind of scratch your head about how crazy it is. But anyway, well, a feature that they've launched with it is an extra battery pack as a range extender uh, and to also make it like even better kind of towing ability. Now, it hasn't been shouted about, but actually having an additional battery pack to make your range or you know, longer or as additional storage, I think is a really interesting feature. And you'll see that coming from a company in the UK called Tuel, um, which is about adding additional battery to vans for fleets where the fleet has to return home and it might be hard to charge at home. So, uh, so yeah, so Tesla bringing kind of wireless and, and range extending batteries. And actually we're starting to see that as products out in the wild. So yeah, 2024 is going to be pretty wild, I think, for new categories, new classes and, and whole new ways of solving problems for customers and for fleets. Excellent. I saw Chul at the London EV show last week. Um, or the week before, whenever it was. Excellent solution. I think there's a uh, big potential there. Imogen, do you have anything? Oh, yes. I've been furiously uh, writing down the names of all of the other ones that have been mentioned. But mine is uh, Candela, who they do hydrofoiling electric boats. Uh, the C8 is their sort of lovely speedboat, but the P12 is a hydrofoiling electric shuttle for, you know, to be used as public transport networks on um, cities that have rivers and, and, and near waters and that kind of thing. But it's so beautiful 
And it just kind of gives you that sense of this isn't just an electric boat. It's a boat that's been completely designed for the future and looks just sensational. Um, so really looking forward to seeing that live in person. I'm a big fan of electrifying things like boats um, and and that aspect of, uh, of transport. I think it's uh, it's the way forward. Michael Thing, a uh, scientist from MIT have developed paper thin solar cells that could be attached to any kind of surface to convert it into a power source. The cells are thinner than a human hair and can be laminated onto, for example, the sails of a boat to provide power while at sea or onto tents and tarpaulins in disaster recovery areas. They use electronic printable inks via a technique similar to how designs are printed onto t-shirts. Um, and they've decided that they're going to use a material called Dyneema composite fabric as the, the backing for it. So the, the cells themselves only generate half the energy per unit area of traditional silicon panels, but 18 times more power per kilogram. Think of the uses. Absolutely fantastic. Many thanks to everybody who took part in today's roundtable. Sarah Sloman, Linda Graves, Claire Miller, George Thurman. And my thanks also to Imogen, who ran the whole show and made it really, really easy for me to just sit and listen. I like this. I might try and do more of these next, uh, next season. Thank you, everyone. Away from our sponsors, ZapMap, about ZapPay, the simple way to pay for EV charging across networks. ZapPay is built to help users search for charge points, plan EV journeys, and with ZapPay, it provides a single place to pay for charging. If you're juggling multiple payment methods across different networks, ZapPay is here to simplify and speed up your charging process. As a single app payment solution, ZapPay consolidates payments into one convenient location. Whether you need high-speed charges for long trips or lamppost charges on residential streets, there's always a ZapPay-enabled charge point to suit your needs. Offering a broad range of payment options, including Google Pay, Apple Pay, Visa, MasterCard, and now American Express, ZapPay provides the flexibility to select the card that best fits your lifestyle. Additionally, when using ZapPay, you can easily track your entire payment history, maintain a record of your charging activities, and manage your accounts with the convenience of VAT receipts for each charging session. Already a ZapMap user? Use the in-app filters to locate ZapPay-enabled charge points near you. If you're new to ZapMap, find us in the Android or Apple App Store and download the app today. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at the new email, which is info at evmusings.com. And I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've got renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingZV with the words, it's not just a guy thing. Hashtag if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks, as always, to my co-founder, Simon. You know, he's prepping his younger daughter for the world of personal electric vehicles. She's learning to ride an e-scooter and the electric unicycle. He tells her it's so that she has freedom to go wherever she wants. But in reality, he's looking to her to be his sidekick when he heads across to the continent next year. On Tour 2024, A has a fabulous ring to it that is extremely exciting. Thanks for listening. Bye.